Hello and uh, welcome to our virtual prize giving for this year's uh, John McGahern Book Prize for a work of debut Irish fiction. Um, naturally, in, a, in a, a normal world, we'd like Hillary to be here in Liverpool with us, but alas, that can't happen. Um, and as with last year's uh, inaugural winner, Adrian Duncan, who won for his uh, novel Love Notes from a German Building Site, We've got to do this via Zoom. So this year's winner is Hilary Fannin's novel, The Weight of Love. And I'm delighted to be joined by Hilary today. We had uh, another strong entry this year, uh, which we whittled down to a short list of three. And the uh, winning entry by Hilary was uh, finally chosen by the Chancellor of the University of Liverpool and one of Ireland's best known writers, Colm Tobin. So, first of all, Hilary, congratulations and welcome to Virtual Liverpool. Thank you, Frank. And I absolutely wish I could be in real Liverpool. I'd love to be there. I'd love to be there and go for a walk. And I'm, um, I'm really moved. Thank you so much. I'm, it was most unexpected and, and I'm hugely grateful. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. And, and I mean, you, you've, you've nothing to thank us for. You know, these things... I, I think maybe all, all uh, you know, every time we put our head over the parapet and uh, compete, uh, we can't know what way it's going to go. And it's, I'm delighted that you, uh, you happen to be the winner this Thank year. You. And uh, I, I want to just talk a little bit about the novel. Um, it's, it's a novel that's set uh, between two, two places and, and two times, which is London in the early to mid 90s and then Dublin in around about 2018. Mm. And it's about uh, love, um, the attempt to recapture, uh, to recapture love. Mm -hmm. it, it asks questions that I think most of us face at some point in our lives, like, it, you know, is our first love our most important love? Uh, can we move on from that? Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it revolves mainly around three characters of uh, Joseph uh, and Robin, friends. Joseph is English, Robin is Irish. Robin's working in a school in, in London. And then another woman, another Irish woman, Ruth, who also works in the same school. And uh, the, the, the novel follows these people's lives as they, as they grow and collide and, and move on, and, and as, as we all do, into, into life. Um, I one of the, one of the th I I'd like to read out just one quote, which is from from page two hundred and sixty two, which I think is a key quote uh, okay. from from the novel, and ask you to to react to it. Which is monogamy, Ruth considered, is fatally flawed. You cannot forget the past. You cannot monogamize memory. Mm. Uh, I think lots of people who read this novel will will see something of themselves in that. Uh, is that something that drove you in, in, in terms of the kind of motive force behind the novel? Mm. Yeah, uh, I th yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think that one of the things um, that drove the novel was this a sense that as you get older, um, there is an expectation or maybe there's a societal kind of expectation or assumption that you settle in some way and you're fine and you know you're 50 or you're 60 and a lot of the building blocks of your life are in place and a bit like you know that the swan gliding on top of the water we don't see the emotional turmoil that's underneath mm -hmm. And I was really interested in looking at that, in how long memory survives. You know, memory doesn't really have a shelf life, I don't think. No. It doesn't have a sell by date. And so, and so we carry, you know, we carry memory around and sometimes it's very heavy. Sometimes it, it weighs us down. Mm -hmm. And Ruth had never let go of her feelings for Joseph. And although their um, relationship took place maybe inside a year it was um it didn't matter how long 
how long that relationship was, it had a really profound effect on her, not just because he was who he was and she had just left Ireland and come to London, but also because meeting Joseph and falling in love with Joseph was was indelibly linked into the loss of her father who had just died before mm -hmm. she left Ireland. Mm -hmm. And so loss and desire are there's a, there's a kind of big alchemy that goes on there between those two things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so so it's bubbling away in Ruth. It yeah. stays with Ruth and it and it it makes her quite cautious as she carries on into her own life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we, we can be quite inscrutable and quite tricky as we get older. And Indeed. it's very difficult to know what people are thinking about. You know, mm -hmm. when we're young, we tell our, each other everything. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then we yeah. get older and we stop. But it doesn't mean this stops or that stops. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I watch my own young children, I'm, I'm frequently struck by their talent at friendship. Yes. Yeah. That, that we lose as we get older. And trust yeah yeah we become more cautious yeah uh, and, and within a marriage you know within a marriage you can you can be you can have an entire universe of your own you know? oh yeah yeah you no know, it is just you know you can be within your own narrative you've got mm. an, your own narrative is continuing you know yeah 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 um I, I i i there's a line from heart of darkness that i'm very fond of uh, where Marlowe says, we live as we dream alone. Yeah, absolutely. That, that we can't actually know each other. Yeah. And, and that, I think that's at the heart of this novel, is yeah. the, the attempts, failed attempts, by all of these characters to know each other. Yeah. And, you know, how that changes and, and, and becomes even perhaps more difficult as they as become they... middle-aged. A friend of mine who I'm very fond of said to me, uh, she read it and, she, and um, she was one of the first readers, actually, and she rang me and she said, uh, I don't like any of these people. I can't stand them. I thought, oh, Christ, what am I going to do now? And she said, I just don't like them. I just don't like them. And then I then I kind of went away and I thought, well, that's all right, really. You yeah. know, because maybe how many of us would be like, by, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that these are these aren't unkind people they aren't mm. uncharitable to one another you know mm. it's just that they're quite honest you know or their internal life is clear mm. you know and mm. maybe that's why they mm. appeared dislikable yeah um, uh yeah i i th th there's one character in particular i dislike but I'll, t I'll tell you off air later on uh, ah no which, really which, which, which will anyway we, we won't go into it now because no i mean that that, that doesn't matter that's yeah. irrelevant but then again is it a writer's job to make like but not at all what can i do you know i i you know yeah exactly i i i do think it's the writer's job to draw us in and and to make us want to know what happens to the characters yeah. and i think you do that very successfully um you know, if there was a character I didn't like, I still wanted to know what, what became of him or her. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, one of the aspects of the novel is that it's split between uh, England and Ireland. And, mm -hmm. you know, here at the Institute of Irish Studies, that's, that's, that's at, at the core of our mission is, is to understand and develop Anglo-Irish relationships mm -hmm. and the reason we were founded in Liverpool is because it's such an Irish city going back to the 19th century and the famine and so on and every second Liverpudlian you meet has Irish roots. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit about what your own experience of the Anglo-Irish relationship is and the emigrant relationship and our, our, our misunderstandings between each other between the irish and the english well i'm i uh like a lot of irish people i'm i was born in 62 so you know um people may or may not know that the start of the 80s in ireland there was a huge recession um and basically absolutely everybody left ireland and went to england and a couple of people hung around to feed the cat but everybody you know pretty much emigrated and I hung on for quite a long time um, here and w was instrumental in setting up a theatre group at that time. But but really, by the end of the 80s, that had kind of run its course. And I ended up joining a lot of mates who were already living in London. And I don't know 
what happens in that cross pollinization but so many of the people that I grew up with went to London and were gifted something that couldn't have happened them here which was an anonymity mm-hmm. and and a chance to live more fully as who they were to to actually kind of unlock their internal selves and let them out for a bit of air as yeah. opposed to the self that they thought they their mothers thought they were back yeah. at home. Mm-hmm. and I saw that and I saw that when t- in terms of people who who were able to live within you know live their own lives you know that maybe people who couldn't have come out at home or or who just couldn't couldn't have spoken with freedom because they were very curtailed by a by the tightness of this society Mm. and now I remember in London in the at that time in the late 80s early 90s I didn't have a sense of being unwanted or unwelcome there Mm. and in fact I think it was after a kind of anti-Irish sentiment and I think it was on the cusp of some kind of real change Mm. um and when I came back to live in Ireland, you could kind of see how people who'd gone abroad and come back were, were affecting change here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And suddenly Ireland wasn't so different than, than the London that I had left. It was just much smaller and more accessible and didn't have to queue up for things. But, you know, it was it was culturally things were changing all around mm. us. and. Mm. And there was a breaking down of kind of old mores and old ways. And Ireland became a much more comfortable place to live in, mm. in the kind of l- late 90s. And without a doubt, that was with the, the diaspora, with a re- partly because of a return of a diaspora or having mm. just been away and seeing how it's possible not to crumble when you live with freedom. Um, yeah, yeah. Kind of emotional freedom. Yeah. I wonder now that we... Uh, are in an era, particularly in in the cities in Ireland, of mm. inflated property prices. Um, are we going to have to face into another generation of Irish kids leaving to mm. find life outside of the country? Yes, I think so, and it makes me, you know, and I feel really, um, I feel really frustrated with it. And mm. we we were talking a little, Frank, about Dublin city now, which. Um, there's a veneer of you know some of the the shopping streets look okay but if you look up you know just look up above the shops you've got kind of half empty buildings from from George Street all the way down to Portobello you've got all these empty buildings you can't nobody can afford to live in the city so like New York or like London mm-hmm. you know it is it is no longer a place of creativity and mm-hmm. everybody you know anybody who's trying to work in the arts now is moving out back to Leitrim, you know, the yeah, yeah. Martin McGarren country. Yeah, yeah. And I was talking with Pom Boyden about this the other day, that there is absolutely no where that you can go and live if you are a, a young artist now, you know, whether you're an actor or writer in mm. Dublin, it just is not going to work for you. And at the time that I was back in London, in back in between back and forth between Dublin and London, you know, we were able to rent flats all around the city and there was a really there was a kind of resurgence and something happened in those darker times of the 80s when that there was actually people started making work in response to the absolute dearth of opportunity mm-hmm. um and people like you know people like Anna and Wright were were starting to to work and to write and you know there was companies like Rough Magic like um uh, passion machine you know all these companies were beginning to make work and were beginning to have a response but largely because they were able to congregate mm. people were actually able to congregate in the city yeah and, and there was a kind of sharing of ideas and the worst thing for me now going into town is just that sense of there's just a death knell there's just mm. a death so yeah in answer very yeah. long way of answering it okay okay back and back and um so i could afford it in in terms of of what it is to be Irish, uh, and I, you know, uh, one of, one of my favourite Joyce quotes, and I'm interviewing it. It happens today on Bloomsday, is um, that uh, he says the, the 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 fastest way to Tara is via Hollyhead. Yeah. Uh, that you have to leave Ireland to see it, to understand it, and I I think that's a, another strength 
of this book that these these are you know Ruth and Robin have left Ireland and they're in London in this period of depression in Ireland and and they can see back to it um and I think it captures it now it captures contemporary Dublin very well uh, Dublin of 2018 where a lot of the action happens and you know the way stony batter has become gentrified and the way you know what used to be sort of old guys pubs are now yeah, you know, yeah. And the gronies and yeah. yeah um and i think that's that's all and and i know that that some of our of our viewers to this will be familiar with your columns in the irish times in which you you capture that very well i think and you know what's lost with that you know it, it i think it's wrong to be all doom and gloom of course it's 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 nice to live in a a bustling cosmopolitan city if that's what it is but uh, mm. you know if you can't afford to live there it's not there's, there's no much point mm. in having that city mm. Mm. um and i think that the, the novel does a great job at that um more specifically the novel a point seems to seems to suggest that there's a problem with us the irish I'll, I'll read you one quote and ask you to respond to it <laughs> uh this is ruth, ruth when she, she first falls for, for Joseph, she thinks of him in her head as a carved saint. Mm. And she, she immediately upbraids herself uh, for that kind of religious image. And she, she says, the dust spores of a national affliction, the habit of sublimating desire. Do you think that is an Irish habit, sublimating desire? I think it was. Mm. I don't know if it still is. Mm. I think I think you ap yes I think you're absolutely taught to sublimate desire from the time you certainly the time you walk through the doors of school a school mm. yeah mm. and I mean think of everything that we had to do you know keep your knees together and your fingers on your lips and sit yeah, there yeah. And you know what I mean yeah and there's absolutely no way that anything was going was it going to be allowed to leak out you know and mm. you know thought or passion and um and yes and a tightness and we all recognize that mm. tightness mm. Yeah. yeah you know and so she had grown up with that mm. all of her life mm. and she grew up in a uh, in we've i figure in just outside of dublin and yes sublimating desire is what we were all taught to do and whether that was kind of um sexual passion or creative desire mm. it's the same thing yeah and you know back to the thing about london was you know the nobody gave a damn what you were doing in london no yeah. you know nobody cared who you were sleeping with or how mm. often yeah. No, nobody cared what you wore or what you drank or, you know, yeah. and, you know, for most people, that was a very, very positive time. Yeah. And, you know, there's a girl, you know, Ruth, when she first moves to London, moves into a flat and set in a shared house in South London with three Irish nurses. Mm. And I had a lot of fun writing those um, sections mm. because I was so many mates that were nursing in London in, yeah. in the late 80s and 90s. And, you know, they would come home and you'd meet people at home in a bar at Christmas, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, they'd be hi Hilary how are you you know <laughs> <laughs> like and you know you were seen the week before you know in the yeah. Ritzy or something and sure then, sure you know, yeah ah, you know wild yeah. just wild you know yeah and I loved that yeah supplement yeah. desire for sure yeah. yeah yeah I mean I think emigration um for all its downsides and you know we often hear about the downsides I think it it provided a, an amazing escape valve for mm -hmm generations of of irish people i think it was it was it was a sadder affair you know back in the 19th century when you left and never came back and that was that you know and, the, and also in the 50s or 60s when i think that you were meeting a different kind of racism but but i think you know there was a, a you know i in the late 80s and 90s in london and not everybody's experience would be the same but i felt I felt that the most overwhelming thing that I was met with was this big runway towards freedom. That's mm. what it just felt like being on a runway towards yeah. freedom. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was, you know, I had had no formal, I had left school quite early and, and everything and, it, and hadn't been to university or done anything like that. And it was the first time when I was in London that I felt, um, you know, it was possible to have an education because it was free. 
Yeah. I went to the city lit and paid 20 quid to do um, a playwriting course with, with Bernard Copps mm. and another 20 quid to do a creative writing course. He used to go over on a Tuesday night and I remember I wrote a, a sentence about some character that I was writing a short story about and I said um, he was like a witch doctor in an icebox and the teachers put to said you just if you're going to bandy phrases like that around the place you need to kind of I don't know, it was just a muscular response to it. Yeah. What exactly do you mean? Mm. You know, you can find your phrases, they're like little postage stamps all over your mouth that you're hurling out, but but come on, you know, make make a bed for it for it. And yeah. and even just I remember leaving City Lit, you know, and coming out onto Hoban and getting on a tube and just like almost like you just felt your blood just moving through your body. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it was just great, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, as as I said to you in our in our in our chat before beforehand, uh, one of one of the notes I made as I was reading the book was, um, uh, has any Irish person of my age not fallen in love in Camden? Yeah. You know, I think I think it is a, a kind of universal experience. You know? <laughs> kind of, yeah. You have to do that. Um, you were born in 1962. So, so how come I'm interviewing you now uh, about winning a prize for a debut work? Why, why didn't this happen a long time ago? Yeah, I'm on the eldest debut in the uh, yeah. in the dance. Um, <laughs> well, uh, because I think loads of reasons. Um, primarily, um, it took me a long time to realise that I could be a writer. I was always trying to go out with writers. Or uh, you know get off with the writer you know ask you know and it took me absolutely ages to to kind of go oh no that's okay you can actually be a writer by mm. yourself it was just a thing of growing up in the 60s no? you know mm. um i was i had really struggled in school i wasn't academic um mm. my home life was a bit chaotic mm. i wrote a memoir called hopscotch kind of all about that time um when i was you know in my when I was about 10, 11, bailiffs came, knocked down the door, took the furniture. Mm -hmm. We lived all over the place after that. Lots of stuff happened to the family. I wasn't a very compliant character. Um, didn't get a leaving cert, came out, waitressed for a long time, then got into acting, made my life in, in theatre and, and eventually um, wrote my first play in about 95 or something mm. like that. Mm -hmm. And the very the first play that I wrote was put on by the Bush Theatre in London, mm -hmm. um, and so then I wrote plays for for quite a long time. But that's tough as well. Mm, of course. And I had children and trying to make a living, and mm. I got picked up by the Irish Times. I wrote a play called Aldrin Bay, <clears throat> and which was kind of zeitgeisty. It was about um, it's about two guys in an advertising agency, and mm. one of them was losing his job, and he gets a final. Um, gig to write a an ad for the Christian Brothers um, and he has to write an ad campaign for recruits for the Christian Brothers and that mm -hmm. was Golden Bay, that was what it was about um, and so the Irish, Jerry Smith of the Irish Times um, saw that and offered me um, a gig writing a TV column, mm -hmm. a TV review column. So 20 years of writing for the Irish Times has been absolute, is what I did then yeah. And during that time, it gave me a kind of stability. There's a few quid every month, mm -hmm. but I've always been freelance um, my whole life. But it was enough to make to get me to begin to think about other ways. Yeah. Other ways yeah. of writing. Yeah. Well, I'm delighted that that it did lead did lead to this. Um, and uh, it's um, it's it's a wonderful book, and I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know others others will too, and I hope that the John McGarren Prize uh, leads to to greater things. Is there more fiction in the offing? Yeah, and it's really funny because I I think it's important. I mean, I am going to be sixty on my next birthday. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of women, especially who maybe twenty years of their lives becomes absorbed. By other people's needs sure and actually at this juncture entering 
my 60th year, it is an extraordinary thing to win a prize like this. And whatever about the money, which is absolutely fantastic, it is about somebody saying, yeah, you have value and what mm -hmm. you have, what you have to say has value. Mm -hmm. And you would be amazed at how underconfident one can be even with some success, you know, because as a child or as a young person, you were told that you weren't good enough or you couldn't do anything mm -hmm. or you weren't fitting the bill. Yeah. And I'd like to say really quickly that I've, I spent about 10 years volunteering in Roddy Doyle's organization, Fighting Words, working with young writers mm -hmm. who I hear the same tone that somebody somewhere along the line has told them that they're not good enough. And and that stays with you for a really long time, but mm -hmm. there is no, there is no limit on imagination, or passion, or creativity, mm. and there's no, um, there's no time frame for that either. Mm. So I'm really proud to be a debut novelist at 59. Mm. That's it's wonderful. So cool. It's great. It's it really is, and it's it's a it's a fantastic uh, achievement. And I'm I really am genuinely sorry that we're not uh, going to head out to the pub now. Oh, I'd love to go there with you. It'd be just so nice, you know. Yeah, uh, but I hope in the near future we'll we'll manage to meet, and uh, uh, that this is the beginning of a, a great career in in the writing of fiction. Well, thank you. Um, I, I really want to thank the Institute of Irish Studies at Liverpool University, um, without whom none of this would be possible, but no, like genuinely, I really am. Um, and to you, Frank, and, and to the McGahan family for, for this. And, um, you know, also, I, I, I was really supported in the making of this book by uh, Fiona Murphy and Alice Yule, who are at uh, Penguin um, Penguin Ireland Trans World and they were just two young women mm -hmm. um, and I never and I felt real I felt like a really young woman when I was with them as well yeah yeah and that was just wonderful great okay uh, thanks very much Hilary and to everybody else go out and buy the book The Weight of Love Hilary Fannin you'll enjoy it and uh, uh, see you all again soon thanks Hilary thanks Frank it was great thank you